Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Reeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome to our lovely guest today, Adam Pritchett. Hi, Adam. Hi, Sue. Hiya. Right, it's lovely to see you today, Adam. And I have to say, you get the gold star for being the first man on the show. So, well done. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for having me. <laughs> and um, I was just chatting with Adam there, saying that Adam's another person that I found through the delights of Instagram. And if I remember rightly, he was taking part in one of these I think it was Stitch Stitch Turber, Stitch October. Was, yeah. That's it, yeah, it was. That's when I, I, I spotted Adam and his work along with a few other people. So, yeah, as, I, as I've said before, I love Instagram for this show. It's really great finding people. And it, it's it's nice a nice way of finding people that possibly you wouldn't have found otherwise as well. So mm, Definitely. Really yeah, absolutely. And we were just having a good old chin wag about Instagram before we uh, <laughs> before I pressed the record button. So um, I've got a short bio here from Adam. Adam Pritchett is a textile artist based in the Lake District in England, and his work is primarily embroidery and focuses on small, intricate details and stitching. Drawing influences from traditional sewing techniques with a twist of often stitching with hand-dyed fabrics and threads. As an artist, Adam works hard to create textiles that have a magic and intrigue to them. He has a passion for hand-dyed fabrics and often embellishes and enhances fabrics that he finds with dyes before attempting to stitch them. As he says, making my own unique mark on each piece I create is an important part of my process. I really enjoy antiquarian imagery i hope i said that right and research (laughs) and research in depth before starting each piece of sewing drawing on those influences as i am forming an idea and i will be sharing obviously pictures that adam's sent to me i'll be sharing those and adam has a website apritchett.co.uk so all of adam's links will be on his episode on stitchery stories dot com and you can all go and have a look there and see what Adam's up to and I guess following him on Instagram as well so there we are so before we get started with your stitchery story today Adam would you like to share with us what you are working on and what's got you excited yeah I'm currently um, working on a couple of different pieces um, at the moment uh, one of which I'm well, I'm mostly excited about um, starting working on this one. But I um, I quite like, as you sort of said in the bio, with a lot of the antiquarian imagery. Yeah. Um, I quite like collecting antique frames, and that's quite an interesting sort of way for me to um, think about how I'm going to start a piece. So yes. I'll have an idea, but quite often use a frame as my sort of my guiding mark to get an idea down. So I recently collected two tiny little brass frames. Oh, I saw they're like those. Part, you, yeah, they're they little part of a pair. Didn't you? Yes, did, they were yeah. lovely. Yes, so very I'm nice. Really looking forward to um, making something to go in both of those because I've got some um, antique black velvet. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it used to be part of a jacket or a coat because hmm. um, you still got the uh, overlocked seams down some of the edges, <laughs> of the fabric, which is great. But um, so I'm going to use that fabric to make something for um, to go in those frames. But it's something I really enjoy because if you find a good frame, it, and it yeah. kind of inspires what you're going to do for the actual piece a lot of the time. Which and, really and that's like. a really interesting starting point to start with. Mm. It's like what I say to people in terms of online marketing, start with the end in mind. And yeah. so often, and I'm dreadful for doing this, is uh, so often I, I, I want to start and I do. And then quite often they, well, how the hell am I going to frame this? Or what am yeah. I going to do with it? It's like, oh, right, damn. I think um, it's it yeah. one of my sort of early, well, I don't want to say mistakes, but <laughs> one of the early things that I was never very good at, I'd sort of have an idea for a piece of work and then I'd um, be so keen to start it. I'd just 
get going and I wouldn't really plan out how it was going to look in the end or what I was going to actually do with it yeah I find I find it a much easier way to work if I've um, got a nice frame yeah that's right and I guess are they relatively easy to find I suppose it's a nice thing to do as well isn't it going rambling around you know shops and stuff looking for the old old frames yeah the town that I live in has got quite a good yeah I'd say good three sort of really reliable antique shops that have always I mean one of them's more of a junk shop one of them's yeah. more like an antique emporium but they're they're great for going around and looking kind of on a Saturday morning uh, to just kind of have a little potter and see if you can find something I mean I've a lot of the really good ones that I found have always been sort of only a couple of pounds really for one of the old frames and you get like something really unique that absolutely yeah and as you say that's going to set the tone for mm-hmm. a, a unique piece of work as well so yeah, all right so you're, you're excited happy. to start with the, uh, the the little bronze frames and you said there was something else as well that you were interested in starting yeah well, I've recently begun it's a bit of a creepy sort of piece with um, some black hands and I'll send you a picture of that <laughs> one as well to post along with it but um, <laughs> I've been I'd hand dyed um, the piece of fabric that I've started this piece on um, and I hand dyed it back at the end of the summer um, and yeah. so I was trying to get like an ombre like a gradient effect on the oh, fabric right. um, which because the fabric that I use is like a wool um, so it can be quite tricky to dye sometimes or there's like a knack to getting it right it doesn't um, really run does it you know silk and stuff's yeah. easy to get that effect put a bit on the bottom and off it goes but yeah wool's a different yeah, kettle fish altogether yeah it really is it can be mm. quite temperamental in um, terms of what color you're actually going to get in as the end result as well but um, I was really happy with how the kind of ombre gradient effect came out on this piece of fabric but um, as a result of being really happy with the fabric, that made me a bit apprehensive to actually start doing anything <laughs> on it. It's too nice to use. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a case of that. So I've uh, I've been kind of putting it off for a little while, but um, I had an idea and I just started because I thought if I don't do anything with it, yeah. it'll just sit in my huge fabric store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> skip with everything else. Oh, brilliant. Okay, so then, Adam, moving on from there, how did you actually get first interested in embroidery and textile art and who taught you and what did you do well um I went to university and um well I initially um I'll give you the long story short really but yeah. <laughs> um, I'd initially gone to university to do a contemporary crafts course right um and I went to Coventry University back down in the Midlands when yeah. where I'm originally from sort of near Birmingham mm-hmm. um and I'd gone to university to do the contemporary crafts course um, and I'd got on to the course and I did my first year. And then for reasons that were known to me, really, the um, course got closed down. Uh. Um, um, so I'd only because I'd only done the first year, the university wanted to just move everybody onto a product design course. Mm. And that wasn't really where my heart was set because I knew that I really liked. I mean, the first year of the course was fantastic. We did ceramics, there was a pottery throwing, we did weaving and tapestry. It was lovely. It was absolutely brilliant. It was exactly what I'd wanted to do. Um, So we got to try out and experiment with all sorts of different things. Um, But yeah, the course got closed down um, and I ended up going on to a fine art degree. instead of the product design one and I enjoyed it a lot and um, but I think the focus definitely wasn't in craft they like oh, no. <laughs> art and so I actually originally did um, a lot of fabric sculptures so I've always had an interest in textiles in one yeah. form or another um, so I did uh, like contemporary installations that were like um, creepy sort of draped figures of fabric <laughs> kind of had to walk into this installation um but that was kind of the route that I went while I was at uni it was all um like fabric sculptures mm. um and after I'd graduated um I'd really enjoyed my time there but I kind of went through a little bit of a lull where I didn't really make have any creative outlet and yeah I felt like I needed to do something um and I'd found a couple of um, old embroidery books when I'd been sort of pottering around in an antique <laughs> um, store. And I just thought, I, again, I'd not sort of long seen a, quite a few embroidery artists on Instagram. So it was actually one of my starting points to kind of think what I could do with it. Oh, um, and after I'd found this book, I just started teaching myself um, 
I was looking on YouTube, looking at different <laughs> videos. So a lot of the time I'd be flicking through the book to get like a name of a different type of stitch that I wanted to try. And then I'd be looking on YouTube to sort of see how you actually did it. And yeah. So just very slowly sort of started to teach myself really. Um, and I mean, a lot of the things that I embroider now, like a lot of the themes as mm-hmm. things that I've always sort of had an interest in in one way or another, um, and it just kind of naturally developed from there, really. Um, right. So that's quite a different, a lot of the ladies I speak to, same as me, it's the sort of stuff you kind of did when you were little, your mum mm-hmm. kind of got you going or you was in a very creative household. But I think to have started kind of on, late on at university through mm-hmm. the university experience is, I think, quite a, a relatively unique story as well. So that's mm-hmm. that's really interesting, as you say. I- good old youtube it's <laughs> yeah, great. It was a it's teaching great yourself resource. to do all sorts yeah. yeah i mean like i mean like a lot of people my gran used, during summer holidays used to sort of teach us so i know yeah. how to knit yeah and all of my knitting experience came from a gran and she taught me how to do that but she's always had quite bad arthritis so she was never any good at sewing oh, <laughs> yes, so it, was, it was one of those things i ended up sort of teaching myself but i've yeah. always had little crafty interests um throughout sort of being younger but yeah most of most of it came after I'd been at university yeah that's absolutely fantastic so you've mentioned about the kind of antiquarian side of things and you know having a look we've got spiders that you've embroidered and all sorts Mm -hmm. of things so what kind of who or what have been your major inspirations um while you've been on this discovery of textile art let's put it that and and currently if they've changed I think they've generally sort of stayed the same if, if they've kind of evolved a little bit as yeah. I've gone on but like I said because I've always had I've been a very big reader so I like books so a lot of the kind of mystical magical sort of things that I do have always been inspired by sort of reading books of sort of stories and things yeah. like that and um, and a lot of the kind of more nature inspired pieces like the spiders and the insects and things like that yeah I suppose a lot of that just sort of stems from my interest in like the natural world, really. I mean, like now I'm very lucky to live in the Lake District and it's been, um, it's a great, well, obviously it's a beautiful area to live as well. And we really Absolutely. enjoy going on lots of walks to a lot of the Rain, Wainwright walks. and Oh um, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> sort of um, different places around here. So it, a lot of the natural world is like a really big inspiration yeah. for a lot of my work. Um, and I mean, the spiders sort of started completely by accident, really. Mm-hmm. I'd, um, but I was playing around with the fabric that I like stitching on the wool and I was sort of cutting holes in it and then sort of thinking, what could I do with a plique or what could I sort of do to do with holes? And it made me think of a spider's web when I'd cut a hole in the middle of this piece of fabric. So oh, yes. I'd, that's that's how it began and I'd sort of started doing buttonhole stitching around the hole and the cut in the fabric and then sort of wove a little web over it and then stitch a little spider on the bottom of it and <laughs> and that was the very first piece that I did um and when I'd posted a picture of that online I'd had sort of lots of friends going oh wow I've never seen anything like that before or like they were really sort of interested and it made me um it made me then think oh what else could I do with bugs yeah. and, it was sort of a bit of a contrast really between it being sort of textiles and soft fabrics yeah and and sort of insects that a lot of people generally don't really like most of the time (laughs) funnel web spiders yeah they come out of cones don't they (laughs) (laughs) have you accumulated any favorite techniques and when you've mentioned the wool and i certainly Mm. i think everything i've seen images that you've definitely been on uh, a, a wool based thing so yeah. what, what would you say your favorite techniques are and why do you like them so much Ad? um I think in the instance of the wool it's such a versatile fabric the fabric store I actually get it from it's titled as a dying wool <laughs> um, so I think the reason that I like it so much is it's quite thick so it's a yeah. similar sort of weight to a heavy canvas right so it's very robust and it's not like felt, it doesn't stretch or warp. Um, right, yeah. But it's very thick. Um, and kind of as a result of that, it's very easy to dye and you can experiment with it a lot. It doesn't really fray. So you can do lots of applique and things with it. So it's very versatile. Um, and I think because as I sort of taught myself, I, I really enjoy uh, lots of bullion knots and sort of French knots. And I like building up textures um, mm. of different 
different types of knots and stitches. Um, and again, when the sort of applique and I, do, I I'm not, well, I wouldn't profess to be very good at beading, but I quite enjoy sort of playing around with it. Um, so I quite like building up textures like that. And this wool fabric is great for sort of being able to take a lot of really heavy stitching. And it doesn't really stretch. Yes, um, yes, it's it's quite forgiving, isn't it? In in that it is. respect, I think, yeah. I think that's why I like using that so much. But um, again, when I'm when I'm sort of using other fabrics and sort of methods, I, I quite like using old fabrics and found things. Mm-hmm. Um, occasionally, you can't always find exactly what you want. Um, if you're searching for old things and you do have to buy new fabrics but um where I can I like to sort of give things a second lease of life um particularly when it comes to old fabrics because I think I suppose part of that stems from when I was teaching myself embroidery Mm. all of the threads that I used to use were ones I'd found in sort of second hand or charity shops Uh, Um, before I'd really kind of gotten into um sort of stitching and uh, learnt which types of threads um, I liked more, whether it was like Anchor or DMC or sort of different brands. Yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of the ones I'd actually started using were, um, I didn't find out until I tried to find more of them. In <laughs> it was a discontinued brand yeah. of thread that you can't get anymore and I really liked sewing with that. Mm. Um, it, was, it was called Flower Thread and it was a quite a, a thick, um, type of cord thread and that was turned out to be discontinued so oh, no. uh, one of those things where you sort of learn as you go on but um yeah I, I really liked the thought that I was giving it a second lease of life by using sort of old things well I think with the, the charity shops there is a lot of scope there for even you know picking up fabric even if it's an old skirt mm. or a jacket or whatever you can cut it up but also things like threads because I've I found that, you know, when, say, somebody's granny's died or somebody in the family and everyone kind of sorts the stuff out and then I, I can imagine the scene where they get to the, you know, piles of embroidery stuff and, well, what the hell are we going to do with all this lot? Oh, we'll chuck it to the charity shop. So yeah, you can exactly. usually find as well those, when I was a teenager, you know, jumble sales were all the rage then, of course, and mm. um, you'd go to the jumble sale and I picked up many kits you know where people had bought like a tapestry kit or a, yeah. a, a, a this kit or a that kit and and kind of done a few like one flower or a stem yeah. or something <laughs> and realized that mm. they were hideous at it and they just got bored and then they would just took it out to the jumble sale and these things even then you know some kits can be very expensive I think mm. a beautiful one with like big thistles that it, it's still framed up now it used to be on the top of the stair in a, the uh, like family home and I've, I've still got it now it's in wool it was beautiful and it's about three about four foot tall you know this thing would have mm. cost a fortune and I, I got it for 10p or something so it's a, a real good hunting ground it for is definitely. different things yeah yeah I mean like my gran always likes to tell a little I mean it's a little bit um a little bit sad but <laughs> she always tells in a comical light that she's the uh last surviving member of her um, knitting circle (laughs) every time one of the other ladies has passed away all of the wool has just been (laughs) given to my grand so she's got a whole spare bedroom full of wool that she (laughs) (laughs) she always tells it as a slightly comical anecdote but it's a little bit sad but I suppose it's the same sort of thing where things just get passed on when they're uh, they do, yes, yes. I've seen it at um, you know embroiderers guild meetings. You know, they say so and so or so and so's not well now, and she's had to tidy up, and it's all these piles of stuff. Who wants any of it? You yeah. know, and it's like oh, it's like a free for all, really. But yeah, it goes, it goes, and somebody somebody else hoards it then. So. Yeah, <laughs> fabulous. Well, we 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 drifted off favorite techniques a bit. So um, <laughs> so yeah, yes, you like the wool and mm. the. Um, the, the knots the bullion knots and things like that so is there kind of anything else that you kind of want to throw in the pot there on on favorite techniques what about hand dyeing you mentioned about hand dyeing your, yeah your I, I, as well. yeah I really enjoy sort of experimenting with sort of trying to get different colors for um dyes and things I mean I did a sort of fairly recent gallery piece that went to a show in America Ooh. um and the piece of fabric that I'd done all of the embroidery with that the whole piece with that show you kind of got in and um, there was a brief so you had to make a piece of work to fit the brief yes 
and I chose to do the brief for that show was the swarm. So however you interpreted that, whether it was swarms of insects or so, it's supposed to be like a creepy crawly sort of show. So it was yeah. a good fit for a lot of yeah, my work. Brilliant. Um, but I'd sort of hand dyed all of that piece of fabric. So I was experimenting with sort of drip dyes of mixing different colours and it was ended up coming out almost like a bit of a tie dyed sort of um, washy colour, which is really fun to sort of experiment. And I like to kind of test test the boundaries of what I can and can't do with things um the different dyes like that so I was using sort of mixes of different dye on dyes so just the the sort of normal hand dye kits yeah yeah get with them um, sort of salt fixants um and I've experimented a little bit with them um, natural dyes with like different sort of mordants like soy milk and things but um I don't have a huge amount of experience with that. So I think it's one of the things that I kind of like to branch into. Yeah, of. so you know, it, oh, that always fascinates me when people mm. dye things with like nettles and this yeah. plant and that thing. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, I, I can feel this like deviation coming on. Right? And that's, oh, no. Mm. So you've got enough to do. To great start. artists, again, <laughs> yeah. that I follow on Instagram. And I think, uh, oh, I can't remember her name, I think it's Rebecca something. And she's got a fantastic book out that's all about natural dyes. Oh. Um, I know she uses av- avocado skins um, yes. and that produces a bright pink dye. Oh, it's, it's amazing, really isn't it? I wouldn't different... expect. No. I think it's, it's sort of like alchemy, really. It's incredible, yeah. the different colours that you can get from sort of substances that you wouldn't expect to get a certain colour from. I think it's really interesting. Oh, well, that's back to, back to the magic again then, isn't it? Mm. The magic of an avocado skin making something <laughs> pink. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. So what would you say then has been the high point of what you feel you've achieved and learned so far Adam given that obviously you, you started all of this whilst whilst at university mm. so have, have you got have you got some high points for us um I think high points for me really I mean I, I love the opportunities that I've had um it's with the light gray art lab in America it's a gallery with my partner is an illustrator all um, right. The, the two of us have both been in shows um, with the gallery and we've kind of even got to know the people that run it, which has been lovely. We even got to meet them in London sort of a year or so ago. Um, I'm sorry, what was the name of that gallery? Then we can the, put that in your links. It's the Light Grey Art Lab in Minneapolis. All oh, right. Um, and they have sort of really interesting, unique shows. They sort yeah. of lots of traditional illustrators and painters but they have lots of sort of mixed media artists and um, textile artists so they have sort of really varied shows and the opportunity I've exhibited with them sort of a couple of times where I've sent work over um to Minneapolis to go up in one of their shows and they're always so much fun to do and it's always a really unique sort of concept. Starting on the international circuit already then well done. (laughs) (laughs) Um I think another sort of high point was uh, I was asked to go on Kirsty Allsop's Handmade Christmas. Um, right. So it wasn't this Christmas just gone, it was a year before. Yeah. Um, and I was doing the Christmas stocking challenge. So I got to embroider a Christmas stocking and they the producers had wanted somebody that did embroidery as well as just sort of traditional sewing on the machine. Yes. So there was four of us that were competing in that um, and I got to do loads of hand embroidery um it was unfortunately it was a time challenge and I only had four hours so <laughs> anyone that kind of does embroidery knows yeah. how much that time that really is to yeah. get done it's never as much as you think it's gonna no, be never at all yeah no but um that was a real high point because I think really? I'd never yeah. done anything like that before and the whole sort of tv cameras things a little bit surreal but it was um it was really exciting it was a bit strange to see yourself on tv sort of a few months later but it's definitely a really big high point for me it was really exciting <laughs> well that's really really good as you say you've not not been doing this that long and there you are sending stuff mm. over to america and and, and, you're, and you're on the telly on kirsty's show well done <laughs> thank you it now and the nice. other the other thing was did i spot that you'd been when you know Martha Stewart in America were you in an yeah. interview or an article or something have I have I remembered that right yeah you have they um they'd spotted my Stitchtober series which is um sort of a challenge that I've done for the last two years um in October so it was originally sort of inspired by an illustrator called Jake Parker Yes. Um, and he does the Inktober challenge. Inktober, yes, I've seen. You know, I've yeah. got various artist friends. They've joined him with mm. Inktober. Yes, and I'd, as I sort of said earlier, my partner's an illustrator, so he's always he's always done the Inktober challenge. Yeah. Sort of 
and after I'd sort of been doing embroidery probably for about a year or so it's that time of year came around again I thought oh, why don't I challenge myself and mm. I'll do a stitched over challenge instead yeah. of an inktober last year and um, the most recent one one of the researchers for Martha Stewart's blog had spotted um, my work I believe it was either Instagram or Twitter that they would saw it onto again social media sort of came in and um, it was a great help and they contacted me and asked if they could do a little uh, a little interview about it it was really exciting and a little bit a little bit strange really because I think a lot of uh, English people that I told about it were like oh who's Martha Stewart yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, any of my American sub friends mentioned it to you they're like oh wow that's wow exciting. Martha Stewart wow yeah <laughs> fantastic so now I've got to ask you this one what what do your mates think about you doing embroidery I think it's um I think it's just something that I've done for quite a while now and yeah they all they think that it's really interesting and it's it's just something a bit different I suppose it's a unusual hobby for someone sort of my age and male I, don't, I suppose but. well yeah because everyone thinks it's like old ladies isn't it really which actually you couldn't be further from them yes there is a lot of older ladies because they've been doing it for a long time but there's a mm. lot of younger people as well but we still have this strange image really I think in some respects that people think it's something that old ladies do around cups of tea which uh, yeah I mean yeah, we I, do. Think <laughs> I, I do get that comment quite yeah. sort of quite often really but I think there's um particularly with social media and sort of now there's been quite a an upsurgence of like contemporary embroidery artists now that are all a lot younger mm. um and I sort of I follow quite a few male embroiderers now that you kind of get to find through sort of different methods where you sort of searching tags and things and yeah. you just stumble across people sort of as you do now but um yeah I think it's really it's really great that it's, it's kind of getting a sort of new lease of life and it, it's, it's kind of cool and, again isn't it yeah I think <laughs> it is and uh, it's really good thing really that you sort of still have all the traditional sort of skills and everything that's now not it's not going to disappear because mm. there's sort of lots of younger people that are kind of having an, an interest in it again I think that's it's really good because it'd be really sad if sort of certain skills like that sort of disappeared Oh, I know, I know. It's, it's, it, it is lovely to see mm. you know that this kind of whole handmade craft art kind of movement mm. just growing leaps and bounds and I think I have to say things like social media makes it a lot easier for people to see when we're not sat in the isolations of our you know front room stitching mm. away on our own it's very easy now to share things and people can you know see what you're doing even from the very start you don't have to be an exhibiting artist that was the only way people saw anything before wasn't it Mm. you were an exhibiting artist now the first thing you do you can share on social media it's just like you know it's so much more like an online community now whereas uh, I suppose before it would have just been sewing circles really like local ones that you'd be able to kind of sit and chat and talk to other people about what you were doing but it's much easier to kind of communicate with people now about it well, with that being said, I still do like our embroidery skill meeting. <laughs> so we have a, we have the cake queen, and I was and she, she always brings us these fab cakes for us to all eat. So, um. <laughs> so now then, Adam, do you have any stories to share with us? And usually, these give us a bit of a laugh when things possibly didn't go quite as planned, and was even maybe a disaster. And really, what did you learn from that experience? Most importantly, so have you, have you got anything to give us a good old laugh with this evening? <laughs> I've certainly had lots of instances where uh, pieces of work haven't gone well. <laughs> uh, I think because a lot of my pieces, I'll sort of have an idea where I plan something out and then I freehand sketch everything. So I use like clover air erasable pens to draw on the fabric oh, as yes. I'm working yes. to sort of help me with sort of shaping and making sure that a composition looks right. And the number of times that you'll sketch something out, you'll start sewing and then you just absolutely hate it. <laughs> and you take one look and just sort of think oh do I even bother putting any more time into this or am I just going to leave it and the number of times that I've got at the bottom of my big sewing basket where it's just full of discarded pieces <laughs> that I never finished because I couldn't stand to look at them anymore but I mean the, the other side of that is you occasionally get an idea from how it hasn't worked as yes. to how it will work sort of better in a different way um 
And I think that's that's something that happens very frequently. I have one amusing anecdote, though. I stitched some spiders onto a coat, my winter coat. Yeah. So there was sort of one on each like lapel on this mm-hmm. sort of big double-breasted winter big woolly coat. Um, <clears throat> and I'd gone out for a coffee with my partner. And in the coffee shop, the barista had sort of taken our order and then she turned around to pick the coffee cups up and turned back towards us and she made a bit of a ah! noise and she was like, is that, the, oh, oh no, they're not real spiders on your coat, are they? <laughs> <laughs> and she uh, thought that both of them were real, which is definitely a compliment for me, on my, <laughs> my heart that they... She thought that they looked realistic enough that they might have really been spiders. But... Then to get you and bite you, yeah, oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one, is that? Oh dear. Yeah, good job you're not in Australia or somewhere. You'd have had somebody like hitting you with a stick, wouldn't you, really? Oh, look, you have a pint of spider <laughs> on you, whack, whack. <laughs> uh, there's a brilliant lady that follows my page on Facebook um, mm. called Sandy, and she lives in Australia and she very frequently sends me fantastic pictures of spiders that her or her husband have found in their house. Oh, and, just... I mean, I, I don't know how she, how she copes with it really, because as much as I love sewing them, I certainly wouldn't want to find some of them in my house, but some of the photographs she sends me are absolutely incredible. Big sort of hunts with <laughs> uh, huntsman spiders or red back ones. And, yeah. Uh... Yeah. So yeah <laughs> it does make you worry if you've ever visited <laughs> australia doesn't it the, oh, the dear. Critters that they have over there oh a nightmare anyway so now you mentioned as well about getting you know getting on with something and not realizing that you don't particularly like mm. it so clearly you do have a pile of some of these unfinished objects have you got any I kind do. of absolute classic ones that you think yeah i'm just never going to get that finished or you know you can't say you're just never ever going to do anything with it there's yeah there's quite a few that are like that I mean the, the likelihood with most of them is that I'll never pick them up again mm-hmm. other than to look at them I certainly wouldn't do any more embroidery on them but I think I'm sort of a bit of a, a bit of a culprit for being very sort of self-critical with yeah. a lot of older work particularly mm. so I have lots of pieces that are um I th- you t- take one look at them now and you think, oh, God, what was I thinking? That's absolutely yeah. awful. I could do so much better than that now. <laughs> and um, there's so many of them that I've got um, a patch that I sell at the moment on my shop that are like machine embroidered ones. Yeah. Um, and the design for that patch was actually inspired by a real embroidery that I did. That was a big sort of hand embroidery. And again, before I'd actually done that embroidery, I'd done a small study that I'd absolutely hated and I discarded the study of that um, sword and it was like a little treasure chest. Yeah. And I couldn't stand that to look at that piece anymore and it, <laughs> I very nearly threw it in the bin, but thought, no, I won't throw it in the bin, I'll just put it to one side. And then so about two, three weeks later, I tried to do it again and then came up with a concept that I actually liked. Yeah. Um, but the others. Yeah, I have lots, lots like that, that um, the discarded pieces that I'm definitely not going to touch again. <laughs> well, some of the artists I've spoken to have said, well, the good are samples, which is what you're saying, you know, it's, mm. a, an, it's an example of don't do that again. Or alternatively, there's others who are of the opinion, cut the damn thing up, cut it up and use it for something else. You know, people are doing a lot of kind of applique and yeah. layering and that sort of thing. It's like, oh, never mm. mind, just cut it up. You'll find some other use for it. So, you know, I think there's, there's, always, there's always hope for everything, isn't there? <laughs> there is. And I, I definitely have done that quite a few times before as well. I mean, with, particularly with some of the uh, hand-dyed pieces of fabric. Yeah. Um, so I've spent a lot of labour, time and effort to kind of get it a really nice colour and then I've done an embroidery on it. And I've just hated it and I've <laughs> unpicked the whole thing or I've cut it up into pieces. And then I recently did, um, it's like a moss, mossy rock. Yes, embroidery. yes, I saw that one. Yeah. Um, and the brown pieces of felt that I'd hand dyed that went onto that piece were originally a different embroidery that I didn't like. And I cut <laughs> it all up and recycled all of the <laughs> pieces of fabric into that one. And I actually like the new piece. So. Well, there we are then you see working out in the end <laughs> yeah exactly and in terms of juggling your projects so with uh, i don't know if you've ever heard the saying beware of long distant elephants so those items that seem such a long way away 
when mm. when you agree to do them and then they creep up and creep up and then all of a sudden they're looming large so how do you manage your distant elephants adam how do you keep track of your projects and your time and keep yourself organized but able to keep that creative juice flowing as well i think it's a, it's a definitely a constant juggling act mm. um, i mean i fairly recently did some embroidery so there aren't really any pictures of it that are available yet but i have sort of collaborated with a fashion designer Ooh, um, and called hogan mccoughlin yeah and he has designed a number of sort of velvet dresses Ooh, gowns lovely, yeah and I've done some embroidery on a couple of panels on one of the dresses. So it's going to have quite a fancy neck design or it was on the shoulders. I, mm. I can't quite remember. But the panels I've embroidered for that are going to sort of be sewn into this dress and then it will be on show at some point later on this year. Yeah. And the embroidery that I did for those, it, again, it was going to be some of the spiders with some of the little um, BD egg sacs and webs and things. So it was themes and ideas that I've done quite a few times before yeah. it's, it's well sort of versed but um so I'd sort of agreed to do that and I was really excited about it but it was sort of months down the line yeah and then it came to me actually <laughs> doing it and I, ju- I was just sort of looking at them thinking oh god I've got absolutely no ideas I, I don't know I know that it needs to be a spider but I don't know how it's going to look and you're just sort of staring at it and you it start the sort of deadline starts to loom and you just think how am I going to do panic, this panic so, yeah it, it's one of those sort of tricky things. I try to prioritise things by deadline. So yeah. if I know it's coming up, I always make sure it's sort of done on time. It's very much sort of a juggling game. It's an art, isn't it? Definitely an it art. Is. Yeah, it, it is. It's definitely something it, that I think a lot of people don't appreciate that when you're a creative person, there's a whole art to the other aspect of making things that trying to stay organised. Yes. <laughs> I don't think it comes naturally to a lot of creative people either. To... No, that's the thing. And that's, to be fair, mm-hmm. why I throw that question in, because I'm, I'm Mrs. Obsessive with plans because I'm a computer person. So it was, mm. so it was quite interesting for me to see how people follow that through. And so then... In in terms of future plans, have you got any plans or projects that you'd like to share with us today, Adam, that we can keep our eye on and see how you get on with them? Yeah, the, the dress, like I was saying, that I'm yes. doing with the uh, that fashion designer, one of the pieces that I'm working on. So I did two panels for that dress and they've been sent back off to America. Yeah. Um, but I still have an, another panel for a different dress. Uh-huh. Um that I'm going to be working on at some point in the next sort of couple of weeks, maybe a month or so, um, after we've, between sort of two of us, agreed what I'm going to do on that one. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be coming up sort of the next couple of months. Okay. Um, and I think he's doing a, a very small release of like a little special collection with some of my pieces and with the embroidery. Oh, well, that's exciting, isn't it? So we'll, um, have, to, we'll have to keep is, an eye out yeah. for those. Absolutely. It's very different. Yeah. I've never done anything like that before. No. So it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm also planning to enter a piece into the Hand and Lock embroidery competition this oh, year. Brilliant. Um, as I, I never have before. Yeah. And it's it's one of those slightly daunting ones where you sometimes wonder if you should challenge yourself and then you kind of think, if I'm thinking about it, then I should probably just oh, do it. Oh, just go for it, so, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> we, were, we were talking about the uh, Embroiders Guild as well, so there's always mm. lots of opportunities there as well with the different members' competitions too. So Yeah, definitely. Yeah, if you want so, um, to um, kind of get things exhibited and give them as a go, yeah, there's um, lots of opportunities. A challenge for myself this year. I'm going to sort of push myself to do more sort of competitions and yeah. kind of things like that where you actually have to enter something and it's not just self-initiated so yes there's a theme and a set of rules etc mm. to, to go on with as well I think that's so. a good way to challenge yourself and it, def- definitely for, for me anyway it's something that I probably don't do enough so it's my challenge for this year <laughs> well there we are so we'll have to keep our eye out for you so well Adam I, as ever I can't believe here we are we're getting very close to our time so thank you so much Adam for sharing your very interesting stitchery story with us today i've really enjoyed talking to you and finding out about how you've got started and all your different ideas and so on now we've mentioned about your website and we'll get some pictures and everything so all your links will be on the stitcherystories.com page Mm -hmm. for your work and yeah so really i'll encourage everybody to go and find adam on instagram for a start off and we'll get your facebook page and your um 
website and everything as well. Mm-hmm. So, so there we are, Adam. That's been absolutely wonderful. I've really, really enjoyed speaking with you today. Thank well, you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been lovely chatting to you. Cheers. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. If you like this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories.